Hi everyone, and welcome to this very first glimpse of Autograph. We're going to dive into our first project, where we'll go over main principles like importing elements into the project panel and assembling them into a composition. This is going to be a complete project tutorial from A to Z. Autograph's interface is made up of four main panels. The project panel, where elements are imported to create compositions where these elements can be assembled. The timeline, where elements are layered on top of each other in a composition, especially here in the part on the left, known as the stack, so that they can be animated in the dope sheet located on the right. The viewer, which displays the result of the composition. And the properties panel, where you can adjust the parameters of the elements that make up the composition. So we're going to start off by importing elements into the project panel, and we can do this in several different ways. First, we can click on the import button and choose to import an image, image sequence, or video. This will open up a window where you can go through your stored files and select an entire group of files, or just a selected few by using the control or command key of your keyboard. Let's start by selecting the elements starting with AFC and Autograph and clicking on Open. By default, the project panel is in grid mode, which displays the elements it contains as thumbnails. But it's also possible to change this to list mode to be able to see more elements in this space. Grid mode does have a parameter that allows you to define the size of the thumbnail so they appear smaller or bigger. You can also use a navigator outside of Autograph and drag and drop files directly into the project panel. We can create a composition to assemble these images by clicking on the button at the top left. In the bottom right corner of each element, there's a symbol that represents their type. So this one is an image, and this one is a composition. The ones that have an image icon are actually readers. Their purpose is to read an image from storage and offer the pixels it contains. By simply clicking on a reader, its properties will appear on the right. We're going to come back to the reader in a little bit, but now if we click on the composition, we can see that its properties also appear on the right. Right now, the composition format is at Full HD 1920 by 1080, but if we click on the format, we can access other formats that Autograph provides as presets by hovering over this list with our mouse. The format changes on the go as we move the mouse. This interactive scrolling is a feature that you'll find in almost every menu in Autograph. You can find the formats from this list in the Software Preferences at the top right, in the Formats section. It's possible to add your own custom formats as well, for example to create specific formats for social networks. Let's click outside of this window to close it so we can focus on the viewer. At the top of the viewer, you'll notice the word Composition next to the letter B. The viewer has two inputs, A and B in order to link two different graphic sources, for example, to compare them. At the bottom left of the viewer, we can see the source format connected in input B. The composition was defined in full HD format, 1920 by 1080. We can see that the source connected to this B input also has a 1920 by 1080 format. If we double click on a reader in the project panel, you'll notice that the viewer's B input is now connected to this reader. You can find the format of the reader image here, on the bottom left, 1440 by 1080. If we double click on the other reader, we'll see that its format is 1600 by 1200, so this image is slightly bigger than the other one. The viewer's B input is the default input used when double clicking on an element in the project panel. By holding down Ctrl before double clicking, we can see that the reader is now connected to input A, which lets us compare input A and B through split screen mode. So we can turn this separator, move it, and modify its opacity 
all while choosing one of the available stack modes. So this way we can quickly compare two elements, like two versions of the same project that are very similar, for example. If we click on the icon on the bottom right of one of the thumbnails, we can choose which viewer and input we want to connect it to. To go back to the original viewer, we can just select full screen and disconnect input A. There is a mini timeline displayed by default when inspecting a reader or composition. By double clicking on a composition, you'll see that the mini timeline of the viewer and the one in the real timeline at the bottom are both connected. By moving in one timeline, we also move in the other one. If the connected element is an image sequence or a video, this will allow you to inspect it directly. But since this is a fixed image, the timeline is useless and we can go ahead and click on the clock to get rid of it. Let's double click on the composition and place one of the first readers into the stack to the left of the timeline. The image being read by the reader is now visible in the viewer as well as in the stack as a new layer. We can do the same with the second reader by dragging and dropping it into the stack above or below the first image. Right away, we can see that one of the images is bigger than the other, which we already saw while inspecting the readers. One image is 1600 by 1200 and the other is 1440 by 1080. By selecting one of the layers in the stack, its parameters appear in the Properties panel on the right. But we can also unfold its parameters to access them in the stack. The elements in the two panels are the same, they're just displayed differently. We'll see that later on. By unfolding the Transform section, we can access the Position, Rotation, Scale and Skew parameters but we can also access them from here. To change a parameter value, we can click on it and enter a new numerical value. But we can also click and hold the left click down and move it to the left or right. Pressing the shift key will change this value faster and pressing the control key will change it slowly. Contrary to other software that use coordinate systems where the origin is at the top left or bottom left of the image, positioning the fighter at 0, 0 will place him in the middle of the image. Autograph's coordinate system is similar to the one taught in schools around the world where the origin 0, 0 is at the center of the composition, or more specifically, at the center of its format. Placing a layer at 0, 0 will position the image at the center of the composition, whatever the format. We'll see later that this can be really convenient, especially when creating symmetrical animations between two elements. Let's select one of the two elements and look at the transformation widget, which will allow us to move without using numerical values. To do that, let's hide the element below so we can focus on one of the two fighters. Let's fold the parameters of the invisible element back up to focus on the one displayed on screen. The transformation widget appears because we're currently in the 2D transformation tool, which you can see on the left. This tool has multiple controllers. If we click on the button at the top right, we can move the layer in all directions. On the contrary, using one of the arrows allows us to constrain movement along one axis. By using the button on the bottom left, we can modify the layer scale uniformly. The two other controllers allow us to constrain changes in scale along one of the two axes. By pressing and holding the Alt key, you can see that these tools are replaced by other transformation tools. When pressing the Alt key, the icon at the top left also changes and is replaced by another one. Taking a look at this menu, you can see that we went from Move Scale Mode to Rotate Skew Mode. This new controller allows us to turn elements, or warp them like a shear. When rotating, we can activate snapping at the top of the viewer to be able to rotate in increments, 
for example to turn in increments of 45 degrees. The controller just to the right lets you adjust the space between the different tools, so you can adjust how far apart they are and get better access to the anchor point in the middle. Pressing the control button moves the anchor point, for example to place it on the fighter's shoulder to set a new rotation point. By changing the content of the default menu at the top left, you can define which type of tool will be displayed first when using the widget. Depending on your needs, you might prefer to choose Move and Scale or Rotate and Skew. When rotating, notice that the controllers that let you move along a single axis also turn according to this angle. That's because local mode is active by default when using the transformation widget, but you can switch to global mode to be able to use the axis always oriented vertically or horizontally. You can also use the blue frame around a layer to resize it. To do that, click on one of the corners and drag it in the direction you want to make it bigger or smaller. By moving a layer in the viewer, these position values will sometimes end up between two pixels, meaning they'll have a value containing a decimal. When a layer has pixels between two composition pixels, it undergoes filtering that can sometimes generate a slight blur. This option rounds the coordinates so that these pixels are always replaced by composition pixels. That way you can avoid filtering and any slight blurring. To reposition a layer at the center of the composition, you can just reset its position values to 0, 0. To do that, you can do a reset by default, but you can also do this in the viewer through this menu containing all layer transform parameters by clicking on the reset button. By selecting or deselecting some of the parameters on this list, each time you press the reset button, you can reset the transform parameter values. Let's place one of these two characters on the left, unhide the second one, and let's position him on the right. These two images are not the same size. To make them the same size, we could of course use the scale parameter to make the fighter on the right smaller and make them the same size visually. But in that case, we would have a visually identical scale but with two different scale values. We could use an external software program to change the size of one of these two elements. Then we could use the same scale value and eventually link these two values during an animation in order to visually have the same size for these two characters. But in order to avoid modifying these original images, let's go into the reader parameters and go to the reformat option. This menu will let us choose a reader output size that's different than the one currently on storage. Here again, we can scroll in the menu to have a quick preview of the various size options available. Let's inspect the reader referring to the smallest image with a size of 1440 by 1080. Then select the reader referring to the other fighter in order to enter a custom value of 1440 by 1080. We can also invert the image horizontally or vertically. Most importantly, we can set sizes for both elements, which will be identical at the reader's output, maintaining a scale of 1. However, you'll notice that in one case, the scale is represented by two values, while in the other case, it's represented by a single value. That's because earlier, for this element, we altered the widget to create a non-uniform scale which separated the scale values into two values, x and y. Parameters in Autograph can have one or more dimensions. If we use the example of a rotation, this is unidimensional. It can only take one value. But in the case of scale, it can have two values, one for scale x and one for scale y. This is also the case for the anchor point, for example. But multidimensional parameters can be represented in different ways. We can use the button on the right to define how these parameters will be displayed. By going back to single mode, we assign the same value to the x and y parameters and go back to having a uniform scale. 
If we switch back to unified mode, the two values, x and y, will be displayed on the same line, which will let us use a single keyframe to animate these two parameters. We'll see that afterwards. Or switch to separate mode, where each parameter will have its own line, allowing us to place a keyframe for one of its subparameters, as each line also has connectors. So we can go back to single mode in order to attribute the same value to the x and y scale parameters. We can also do the same thing for position by assigning a single value for x and y. Of course that means that the layer will only move diagonally. Let's switch back to unified mode so we can control x and y separately. The channel selector at the top left of the viewer lets us inspect the different image layers. In particular, the alpha layer, which allows us to see that there are transparent pixels in this composition. We can also click on the checkerboard button to see the transparent areas represented by the checkerboard background. Since each layer defines its own transparency, Autograph creates a kind of selection map that allows us to effectively select what we see in the viewer. Images containing an alpha layer continue to be rectangular in shape, and even if we don't see some of these pixels, they definitely still exist. In many software programs, clicking on these pixels prevents us from getting through them to select elements underneath. Autograph doesn't have this issue and a flash appears when moving the mouse over elements, according to the outline of the layers. In addition to this flash, you'll see that the corresponding layers in the stack also become highlighted. By clicking on this button, the visual stack will appear to the right of the boxer. This lets you quickly see the layer stack of the composition. We can click on the elements of this stack to select the corresponding layers. The layer number is displayed on the left and it corresponds to the layer index in the stack. Layers that aren't visible in the stack automatically disappear in the visual stack. This lets you easily visualize elements that would be completely hidden by other elements. A yellow contour appears around every selected layer according to its alpha layer. You can disable this by clicking on the Overlays button and choosing which type of overlay you want to appear, if any. Here you'll see the option to disable the yellow contours as well as the option to disable hints, which are the flashes you see when placing the mouse over layers. You can also make the format boundaries disappear. For now, let's reactivate these elements and focus on animating our layers. Let's select the layer at the top of the stack, representing the fighter on the left, and rename it fighter underscore left using the F2 key. We'll do the same for the second layer, naming it fighter underscore right. First, let's focus on animating the position of this layer, and instead of opening up all of its transform parameters to access this parameter, We'll use filters so only the position of the selected layer is displayed. You'll notice that on this list, each parameter has a keyboard shortcut, so we can just select the two layers in order to automatically unfold the transform section and display the position. The search area below is outlined in green, which means that a filter is currently enabled. It's also possible to enter characters into the search bar to filter layers which you can see here in green. Just note, this filter just hides certain elements in the stack, but all layers are still present in the composition and the viewer. Let's move this layer to the left of the composition so that the ear is positioned on the edge of the image at around minus 700 pixels. Remember that 00, zero is at the center of the composition and let's focus on animating its position. Let's position ourselves at one second and create a first keyframe for this parameter to start animating. All dedicated keyframe functions are available by clicking on this button, like adding a new keyframe in the current spot or deleting an existing keyframe. The side buttons are intended to move in time to the nearest keyframe to the right or left. When creating multiple keyframes for the same parameter, we can quickly jump left or right from keyframe to keyframe. With every click, the circular menu that appears under each keyframe disappears by default, but you can keep it open by pressing the control key. 
so you can continue to quickly click on the buttons. You have to press and hold the control key after opening the circular menu. Our layer is now outside of the composition. By default, everything outside of the format isn't visible in the viewer. That's because the format clipping button is enabled below the viewer by default. If we disable this option, now we'll be able to see what's outside of the format. This allows us to better visualize elements as they enter the composition before enabling clipping again to better see the final image. This numerical value allows us to change the zoom value, and we can also select a value from the list or use the mouse wheel or use the control and alt buttons and left click. To move within the viewer, we can press the mouse wheel or the spacebar. In order to always frame our entire composition, Autograph has a button located at the top right that allows us to always frame our entire composition, regardless of the size of the viewer and panels. So usually we'll navigate between the 100% button, which we can locate on the list containing different sizes, in order to navigate between the real size, and the auto fit button that allows us to frame the composition. Now the fighter on the left enters the shot from left to right. And if we want to replicate this animation with the other fighter, we can just select the left fighter's keyframes and copy them by pressing Ctrl C. Then we can go to the beginning of the animation and paste them with Ctrl V after selecting the layer containing the second fighter. Now that the two elements are on top of each other, it's hard to distinguish them, but by hiding one of them, we can see that the two layers move in the same way. Instead of copying the keyframes, there is a whole other way of replicating this animation. Let's press Ctrl Z a few times to go back. We're going to create a link between the two position parameters. To do that, we can click on the connection slot of the first layer and select Copy Link. Then click on the slot of the second layer and select Paste Link. Now you'll notice that the position parameters of the second layer are grayed out and inaccessible because they're being controlled by the position parameters of the first layer. Notice just below the right layer's position parameter, there's a reference to the layer controlling it. Any modifications to these keys will be applied to both elements through this link. By using Alt plus the mouse wheel, or Control, Alt, and left click, we can focus on one second. Also notice that a plug icon indicates that this parameter is controlled by another. By clicking on the connection slot, we can disconnect it. Now that this position value also evolves, we can modify it with modifiers. Here we'll add a math modifier. The purpose of this modifier is to alter a value after it's been generated or plugged in through a link, as we just did. So we can put this math modifier in multiply mode, and the multiplication value will be negative 1. A position value that was originally negative 700 is now 700. This allows us to make a symmetrical animation from the center of the composition. By unhiding our second layer, now we can see that both fighters have a perfectly symmetrical animation. The output value now shows 863 instead of negative 863, and any changes made to the animation will be applied to both elements because the animation source for both layers is the same. The right part of the timeline can vary and be assigned different modules. Like here, the default module is the dope sheet, where you can manage timing, time shifts between layers, and of course, alter keyframes. But we can replace this module with the graph editor module that allows us to work with interpolation values between keyframes. For now, this parameter's two keyframes create a linear interpolation that makes our layer move at a constant speed. But by selecting the first animation key, we have access to around 50 predefined interpolation types that let us change how these two fighters enter the composition. Changing the interpolation type can be done interactively and can even be done while playing the animation. For example, we can use the elastic interpolation type so that the boxers enter with a back and forth movement. 
We can also test out the bounce interpolation type to have a bounce when the layer reaches its final position. Here we'll select the quartic interpolation type so that the layers quickly move into the composition and then slow down as they get to their final positions. Let's keep this interpolation type and go back to the dope sheet module. If we move a layer in time, it'll be invisible at the start of the animation and come into the scene a little later. That's because as you can see here, its block isn't visible at the start of the animation. The animation in itself remains the same, which is normal because the two elements refer to the same keyframes, which are temporally defined on the left layer. That's because when creating a link between two elements, the follow time option is enabled by default. By deselecting this option, we can maintain the animation link between the two elements while at the same time causing a time shift on the second layer in order to shift the animation in time, making it enter the composition later. Any modifications made to the keyframes that animate the fighter on the left will of course be replicated onto the fighter on the right, but with the time shift brought on by sliding the layer in the dope sheet. This allows us to subsequently modify an animation without having to recopy and paste keyframes from one element to the other. When the fighter on the left enters the scene, there isn't any motion blur which would allow for a more fluid animation. To add a motion blur, we're going to start off by selecting the layer and getting rid of the filter which for the moment only displays position. Let's unfold the motion blur section, which is also accessible in the project panel on the right to activate it by modifying its quality value. Instead of calculating and accumulating additional intermediate images between the two images, like many graphics software applications do, Autograph uses a different method that disperses pixels over time in order to generate a blur effect. The motion blur quality parameter allows you to define the number of pixels that will be accumulated on top of each other with a value between 0 and 1. So for example, a value of 0 0.15 will leave spaces between the pixels, whereas by increasing this quality value, the motion blur will become much smoother. Keep in mind that the higher the motion blur quality value, the more autograph will have to calculate. Increasing this quality value to 1 is generally not needed. A value of 0.15, as you can see here, already gives pretty good results. Increasing this value to 0.5 or even 0.25 is usually enough. In any case, Autograph is extremely optimized for its motion blur calculations, and even by pushing the motion blur quality to 1, the software always remains responsive. Let's click on the motion blur quality parameter name so we can copy and paste it into the second layer's motion blur quality input. Motion blur quality isn't a global parameter applied to the composition. It's locally defined for each layer. So it's possible to change a layer's shutter angle without modifying the shutter angle applied to other layers. For now, let's go back to a value of 180. Let's select all of our layers with control A and go to the Fold Selected Layers option to fold them back up. There are of course keyboard shortcuts for all of these functions. Now let's focus on the background to add an animated colored background behind the two fighters. To do this, we'll use one of the generators Autograph provides. In Autograph, a layer is positioned through transform parameters, but is represented by what is connected to its source. The source can connect to one of the elements in the project panel, like one of the readers for example, but it can also connect to a local generator. If we want to change the source for the fighter on the left with another source, for example the fighter on the right, we can click on the reader and drag it onto its source input. So we can quickly change a layer's source, all while keeping its transform parameters and animation. This replacement element can be added by dragging and dropping it onto the source parameter slot or onto the slot just above it, which is a duplicate that allows you to quickly change a layer's source when it's folded up. But it's also possible to use a local generator as a source, like this polygon generator. 
Now the reader is replaced by a polygon generator that can even be shared between multiple layers. We'll see that in another tutorial. This generator has a whole bunch of parameters visible in the Properties panel. So a layer source isn't a fixed element, and it can be replaced at any time without changing the animation that's applied to it. It's also possible to disconnect a layer source without necessarily reconnecting another element. In this case, we'd have what's called a null layer. A null layer has transform parameters and it's represented by this little plus sign, but it isn't connected to a source. Let's reconnect our reader onto the source input of the fighter on the left, add a new gradient generator, and drag it to the bottom of the stack. This layer is perfectly identical to the other two layers in the composition, except that its source is a generator. Many of Autograph's generators have their format set to unbounded mode by default. This means that they're not spatially limited, so they can extend infinitely. By disabling clipping in the viewer, we can see that this element is defined without limit. We'll come back to this extremely important aspect of Autograph later. Let's re-enable clipping and enable autofit. Creating this gradient has automatically changed the active tool at the top left of the viewer. Clicking on it displays the history of all the tools used since the beginning of the project. So we can quickly go from the layer selection tool to the gradient editing tool. Keep this tool history feature in mind as it'll save you a lot of time when switching from one mode to another. Let's zoom out a bit. Change the gradient points to make them look diagonal. And take a look at this layer source. Clicking on the source in the stack directly displays its properties in the Properties panel. And clicking on the layer itself allows us to unfold its source so we can get into the generator. The Timeline and the Properties panel show the same information but in different ways. In the stack part of the timeline, we can access elements by unfolding different sections, whereas in the Properties panel, we go in and out of the different sections organized by hierarchy. To change the gradient colors, click on the first stop on the left and change its color. Here we'll choose a blue color that'll be assigned to the point at the top left. At the same time, we'll select the second stop and assign it a complementary color that's warmer. The gradient generator has a lot of options, like creating linear, radial, and circular gradients. But for now, we'll put these options aside to focus on a simple example. Let's go back to the selection tool, frame all of our composition, and work on the background. For now, let's hide the two fighters, or we could also select solo mode for the gradient, and let's use the source with the outline of the logo. The logo of well-known AFC, Autograph Fighting Championship. In the same way we added a numerical value modifier earlier onto the position of our fighter, we can also use image modifiers, which are applicable on sources, like adding a blur, which allows us to blur our logo. A new modifier section will appear in the source section, allowing us to go into and modify its parameters. To get rid of it, we can either select it in the stack or the properties panel and click on the delete or backspace key. Here we'll apply another modifier called tile. We can click on the modifier slot and look for it on the list or type its name in the search bar to filter the results. We can also select the layer and go into the modifiers menu to access the same list but organized by category. The purpose of the tile modifier is to multiply a graphic source, so we can add margins between each duplicate with the gutters parameter, for example. So again, the copies of this logo are multiplied infinitely. That's because the tile modifier uses the unbounded output format by default. Of course, we have the option of modifying the format 
to limit the extent of the copies, but we'll leave it in unbounded mode because we'll need it. Now we can move, turn, and resize this element without having to worry about its spatial limits. Let's finalize this element's position by reducing its size a bit and setting its rotation value to 30 degrees. Autograph offers many modifiers. They can be numerical or linked to images or even to transform parameters, allowing distortions or transformations to be applied on the geometry of the image. Certain modifiers can sometimes appear under multiple categories. This is the case for the transform modifier, for example, that allows you to apply a transformation in addition to the one provided with the layer. But it's also possible to add a transformation at the source level, meaning at the pixel level, before going through the transformation linked to the geometry. By adding a transform modifier before the overall layer transform, it's possible to add a lateral slide to the logos before the global rotation of 30 degrees. Keep in mind that it's the source pixels that undergo a transfer before going through the global 30 degree rotation. This allows you to define complex operations without using any programming languages. By separating the X and Y position values, with separated mode, now we can guide the X value according to a new current time generator, which takes the current time of the composition and plugs it into this parameter. The number of seconds elapsed in the timeline since the start of the animation will be plugged into the X value. Since the graphic element is only moving one or two pixels right now, it's difficult to see the evolution of this parameter. The current time generator has a multiplier parameter that lets us multiply the result by 100, so that this time we see the logos advance. First, keep in mind that the current time generator allowed us to animate the X value both procedurally and automatically, and it'll continue to move without stopping over time. Second, with this tile modifier multiplying these logos infinitely, we don't have to worry about its spatial limits. So this way, we can generate backgrounds without worrying about any spatial or temporal limits. Let's go back to the main layer line so we can modify the opacity parameter to make these logos slightly transparent. This parameter is actually a copy of the opacity parameter located just a bit further down in the stack. Same thing for the button next to it on the left, which changes the layer's blending mode. Here we'll select Overlay, but this controller is actually a copy of the blending mode located a little lower in the stack. We also have the possibility of animating this parameter. Thanks to the gradient generator and the tile modifier, we can quickly put this background in place, which will liven up the composition once the two fighters appear on screen. Our two fighters enter into the shot one after the other with the animated background. Let's import the Autograph Fighting Championship logo and move it so it's at the bottom of the composition between the two fighters. We have the possibility of animating its scale with keyframes, like we did before, but here we're going to do it a bit differently. Earlier when we used the graph editor, we learned that there were around 50 different interpolation types available for keyframes. If we want to animate a parameter according to a start time, end time, and an interpolation type, instead of according to keyframes, we can use the animator modifier. The goal of the animator is to add or replace the start value of the parameter with a destination value. If we define the scale value, which was initially at 0, and we indicate that we want to progressively replace this value by 0 0.5, by defining an elastic interpolation type, then this scale will automatically be animated according to these parameters. We just have to determine the animation's starting point and its duration, or define a timecode for the start and finish according to the composition. It's possible to take the time offset applied to the layer into account, or to ignore it based on the absolute timecode values of the composition. 
we have the possibility of testing other interpolation types, like bounce mode for example. We can click on the back button to examine the animation multiple times. Once the animation is set, all we have to do is activate its motion blur a little further down. Remember that the quality parameter allows you to define the dispersion of pixels over time and that it's not usually necessary to push it to the maximum. Let's fold all of the layers back up and insert the Autograph Fighting Championship logo title at the top of the stack. We'll use an animator again by dividing its X and Y position beforehand. Let's enable solo mode so we can just focus on the logo. We'll move it outside of the composition by disabling clipping so we can see where it is. Let's add an animator, but this time set it to offset mode. Now we'll use the starting position of the element and then move it by negative 270 pixels. Contrary to the logo at the bottom of the composition that has a scale value which changes progressively from 0.0, .0 to 0 0.5, here we're using offset mode to add a value to the original position so we can move the layer while keeping the animation. After setting this layer's motion blur, we'll disable clipping mode in the viewer and disable solo mode as well. Let's move the layer block in time so that it enters the frame a little later. This time offset value is also represented numerically a little further down. So we can manually move this layer with the mouse or set a time offset value numerically with this time code. This concludes the first part of this tutorial, which will be followed by a second part where we'll create banners at the bottom of the image and display the name of our fighters. But these banners will be created in a second, separate project before being linked to this main project, as Autograph allows you to connect projects in a completely dynamic way. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more Autograph tutorials. Thanks for watching!